Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us for yet another rock and pop up with the geology gents, Gavin and Graham. Uh, my name is Marisa. I'm the public programs manager at the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. And we're um, really excited to spend our afternoon with you today. We hope that this is a wonderful uh, welcomed reprieve for you all um, from checking the news constantly. Uh, we are going to be talking about something um, that is very, you know, fundamental and uh, constant and yet also, you know, constantly changing uh, as we reflect on, you know, changes elsewhere in the world around us. So um, yeah, we're gonna have a lot of fun with this today. And I'm gonna welcome in the geology gents, Gavin and Graham, to tell us a little bit more about what we're gonna be talking about this rock and pop up. Thanks, Marisa. And I think that that's a good point. Uh, when you think this, maybe this rock and pop up, pop up will give us a little bit of perspective because when you think about the changes going on in the world today, it's nothing compared to the last four and a half billion years. So let's, let's see what the continents did, shall we? Yeah, let's hop in. You know, we've got these, these old globes behind us. Folks looking will probably recognize none of the land masses here because Earth has been changing. That's over right. The last four billion years. Right. So with that, I'm going to share my screen and we will we'll jump into what we're going to talk about today. And that is continental conglomerations. We're talking about supercontinents today, Graham. And this is just such a cool one. This is such a cool topic for a rock and pop up because it is so fundamental to the geologic world. The, this, this is sort of like a fundamental theory in geology, right? That's right. Yeah. And most of the times in our rock and pop ups, when we would you know, be chatting with folks in person about rocks, and now when we're doing these, uh, these videos talking about all the great things about rocks, we always come back to these you know, different ways that rocks form. Where do rocks form? How do they form? What's driving this? And everything we talk about, we can often pretty much always end up tracing back to this idea that you know, the earth is covered in plates that are moving around and interacting with one another. This is really important for how we think about geology. Oh, great, great thing to segue into our first slide, Graham. So the background for today's talk is gonna be based around three fundamental questions and then we'll jump into supercontinents. But to get everybody ready, Graham, I'm gonna pose a question to you and you kind of already answered it, but spoiler alert, let's just, let's jump into it. So. What causes the positions of the continents today and why are they shifting? Yeah, and so as you've shown on this slide here, Gavin, you know, we've got these, these funky little boundaries that don't quite match up with the continents as we know them, but that are sort of sprawling out. And there's like this jigsaw puzzle of all these, you know, parts of the earth and how they, the parts of the earth's surface, I should say, and how they come together. And that is because our continents, our oceans, everything sits on top of these, you know, these puzzle pieces of interlocking tectonic plates. Ah, yes, Graham, plate tectonics. That is one of the most fun things. So again, as you said, we have these plates, they're moving around. And so it's a real, this is a really important point. The way our, our continents are sitting now wasn't the way they were sitting previously and it's going to change in the future it is constantly changing so this is one of the major fluxes in geology that's exactly right and i and i think one of the things that's so cool about it and one of the things that always inspires me as a geologist is that you know folks had thought had made suggestions that like hey maybe these continents are are moving around you know for those suggestions are only, you know, a little more than a hundred years old. Um, and it really wasn't until like the 1950s, 1960s, that folks really started to, you know, geologists really started to agree with one another that, yeah, these are moving around, they're changing positions through time. And so in a way, like this is the, this is the foundation of modern geology. And that makes geology, as far as sciences go, a pretty, a pretty young, dynamic, and exciting place where we're still just kind of figuring it all out. So it, it makes it a, a fun, uh, at least for me, it's a fun place to be because we're really just, you know, kind of just getting started building, building our whole, our whole picture here. Such a good point, Graham. Such a good point. And, and I really, I think that we gave 
the audience a softball with this first question, because based on all of the people we talk with, we always, as you said, come back to play tectonics. And this is something that people normally remember from their, maybe their earth science class in, in uh, high school or something. But so let's go with a little bit more of a difficult one. How do the plates move? Sure, we have moving plates, but like what actually is driving their motion? That might be something that we should cover, right, Graham? Because if we're gonna crash plates into one another, we should know how, how that happens, right? Absolutely. Uh, and so you've got some diagrams up here, and I think it'll be, this is gonna be helpful for, for bringing this all together. One thing, you know, we, I mentioned a little bit of, of geologic history, not history of the earth, but history of the study of geology. Some of the first folks thought that you actually just had continents cruising across the ocean floor. Is, is that what's happening on Earth, Gavin? Well, Graham, that is not at all what's happening. Continents are not floating on water, but there is a boundary. And this boundary is one that I point out here, and that is the lithosphere versus the asthenosphere. And so these are, these are some interesting words, but what, what does it mean, Graham? What is that boundary? Oh, yeah, that's a, that, that's, that's a fantastic question because for the longest time, I would see these words and be like, cool, those are some doozies. And I'm sure they mean something, but it, is, it escapes me. Um, and so the best way to think about it is that the lithosphere, that's all the hard, that's all the crunchy stuff on Earth. Um, that's that hard, brittle um, exterior. And that asthenosphere, that is the part of the earth that is fluid, but not molten. So it's not a liquid, but it's fluid. Gavin, it sounds like I'm contradicting myself. What am I trying to say here? Graham, this is a tough one. This is one that vexes many a, a first year geology student. And that is the fact that the asthenosphere, which is at comprised mostly of the upper mantle, behaves as a fluid, but is not liquid. And so the reason we make that distinction is, is important, an important one. That is, and it deals really in the time scale, right? So if you drill down there, this would still be rock, but it moves ductily. And when you think ductile, think like what, what silly putty would move like, or a thick caramel it moves like a liquid over long periods of time, but it's actually still a solid. So it's not lava down there, it's still rocks, but it's under a lot of pressure. And so it's, it's moving over time. It's able to move, whereas the liquid, the lithosphere rather would break, right? So that's the brittle lithosphere, the ductile asthenosphere. Okay, excellent. And so, what we've got going on here then is we've got our, our crunchy, rocky rafts that are moving over our chewy nougat interior. And <laughs> that nougat is actually, that, that gooey asthenosphere is actually moving those plates around because it not only is it flowing, but it's actually kind of behaving like, like a pot of boiling water would where you know, as you see those bubbles come up, if you look in there, you can also see water kind of swirling up and down. You can see it going up and down. And the same thing is happening to our mantle that's heated at the base. And so it kind of buoys up and then it gets up to the surface, cools, and then sinks back down. So you build these big sort of rolling cells um, that we call convection cells. It's, you know, comes from the term convection that you know, maybe some of you are like, oh my goodness, I remember learning that in a science class. Uh, maybe some of you are just learning it now in your science classes. It's a, it's a super important process. Um, and the geology gens are big fans of it. So, so Gavin, well, while our mantle is convecting, what does that do to our, our, our rocky plates up on top? Well, Graham, this, I'm, I'm glad you went here because this is basically like a question within my question, right? How do tectonic plates move? Well, they are floating basically for lack of a better term on the asthenosphere, but why does the asthenosphere move? And that's what you're getting at. That is why we talk about these convection cells. So the asthenosphere is moving because when you are flushing heat or churning heat in the mantle, as that heat sort of makes these cells that go up around and down. So that's pulling the continental plates along. So the, the lithosphere 
is along for the ride and the asthenosphere is flowing because it it's there's heat moving through it that's great so we're just like cruising around on this big rocky conveyor belt i love that's it right. that's what name is? okay graham so that's how they move but we're talking about supercontinents today so to form those, you have to crash some continents together, right? So what happens when you crash continents together? This is another one we've talked about a bunch in rock and pop-ups because we live in California and we make California by crashing a bunch of rocks together. So let's start in California. What happens when the plates hit each other or crash into each other on the coast of ancient California? Yeah, that's great. So, <clears throat> And you know, I, I like how you're setting this up, Gavin. What we're doing is we need to bring continents together. But before you can bring a continent together, you gotta get rid of that pesky ocean, right? And so what starts happening is as these things are moving around, sometimes these oceans and continents are kind of squeezed together. And that ocean, these, these ocean plates that are kind of heavy and dense compared to these continents, they slip and drop down and start sliding beneath the continents. We call this subduction as we subduct our ocean plate beneath the continental plate. And as that ocean plate starts going down, all sorts of awesome things start happening. Gavin, what, what happens when that, when that sort of waterlogged ocean plate gets into that hot mantle down there? Well, Graham, as we said, the asthenosphere, the upper mantle is rock, right? It is rock. It moves ductily, but it is rock. Well when you pump in a bunch of ocean water in on a down going slab, it melts, it causes melting of that rock. And that's why we get big volcanoes in subduction zones. That's why our uh, Sierra Nevada mountains are there because a bunch of ocean water goes into the upper plate, the continental plate as the down going oceanic slab goes under it. So that's why we, when we see mountain building events that happen at subduction zones, they're often associated with volcanoes and stuff like that. But Graham, I, I think that you made a really important point here, and that is you're subducting the ocean plate because of density, right? It's denser than the continental plate, and so that's why subduction zones happen. And you also made another really good point, and that is this process is what closes oceans. So what we're, remember, we're framing all of this for... for supercontinents. Well, if you're going to crash continents together, you got to get rid of those pesky oceans, as you said. So this is how you do it. You subduct the ocean crust, and eventually you're going to crash a continent into it. So I gave it away, Graham, but what's the other, what is the other sort of uh, regime that we look at when we think of things crashing into each other on the Earth's surface? Yeah, that, this is great, Gavin. I, so, right, eventually, we're subducting the ocean and that ocean's going down, down, getting out of there. And eventually we just run out of ocean. There's no more ocean left and we start banging continents into one another. And so Gavin, yeah, I, I love that you brought up the concept of density, right? Like, like the ocean crust falls down and slides beneath because it's denser than the crust. So some of you may, they may you know, have done this experiment either you know, cooking in the kitchen or maybe did it in a science class once where you mix oil and water, right? That oil floats up on top and that water sinks below because that oil is less dense. So the ocean continents or the, the ocean oceanic plates are like the water, the continents are like the oil. They, they, they easily you know, separate and one floats on top of the other. But Gavin, when we bring those continents together, that's like oil hit, mixing oil with oil. So what happens when, we, when those run into one another? Well, if you can't go down, you got to go up, Graham. And so <laughs> these continent-continent collisions are where we build some of the biggest mountains on, on Earth. So if folks caught our rock and pop-up two pop-ups ago when we talked about building the east coast of the United States, this is what happened. You rammed a bunch of continents uh, into each other and you, caught, you built big mountains. But if you don't like to think 400 mil million years back, we can instead go to modern day India and see the exact same process going on. And that is the Himalayan orogeny. So Graham, why do I bring up the Himalayan orogeny? Ooh, because this is a place where the Indian subcontinent um, or the, in the India plate, which used to be its, have its own Indian continent, 
came crashing in to the Eurasian plate. And as these things squished together, we lifted up a huge mountain range and the huge Himalayas, the home of the tallest mountain on earth are exactly the sort of things you make when you crash continents into one another. That's right, Graham, exactly. And so this is the sort of process that is going to build supercontinents. When you're crashing continents into one another and you can think of India as its own continent, it crashed into the Eurasian plate and then it kind of stayed there, it stuck there. And so that's how we're starting. If you do that to every single continent on earth, that's how you build your supercontinent. And I just want to plug a little geologic fascination of mine before we go on. And that is what happens when you punch the Indian plate into the Eurasian plate. It kind of just like, it's like you're putting like a hard thing into silly putty and, and the, the land mass just wraps around that continent and you get these huge continent scale folds in modern day Pakistan. So if you guys, if you guys out there, the audience wants to go and look at cool geologic maps or satellite images, look at Pakistan and India and the Himalayas. You're just getting giant folds. It's really interesting. I digress. So Graham, this is a story. The, con the supercontinents are a story of continental bumper cars. We're <laughs> crashing subcontinents together um, and making giant continents. So this continent, this supercontinent is one that's very famous. It's probably the most famous one, Pangaea. We know the most about it because it's the most recent supercontinent. But Graham, is this the only supercontinent? Goodness gracious, no, Gavin. The continents have been bumping around. Um, and these, these tectonic plates have had four and a half billion years of time cruising over the mantle to run into each other. So we've got a, a whole list of supercontinents reaching all the way back deep into the, even the, the, the pre-Archean, into the, you know, the, the very hot and very unpleasant Hadean part of our Earth's history. <laughs> That's right. And I will, I will be honest to the audience here, and that is we really don't know that much about what the surface of the Earth looked like three and a half billion years ago. We, we know a little bit and we, can, we know that there was probably a supercontinent there, but there was also a lot less land, a lot less actual continental crust. So these aren't really, these first ones aren't really supercontinents like you'd think. The first really big one is probably Kennerland and that's the one we're gonna start with. But Graham, I just wanted to remind everybody with this picture and that is to build supercontinents, you are closing your oceans and can we, you just run through real quick, like what is going on in the oceans now and what goes on when you close them? Oh my goodness, Gavin, it would be my pleasure and honor to get to talk about how we make ocean, right? Because if we're crunching continents into one another, there's a whole other side of the earth that we need to, we need to cover that space with. And it's, it, if, if you're thinking that the, the plates separate apart and open up the mantle to the surface, well, you're not entirely right, but you're not entirely wrong either because where right across from, or, you know, the places where plates aren't coming together, they're opening up, opening up at what we call these mid-ocean ridges. And that's places where the, the plates get pulled apart so thin that the mantle actually comes up melts as it comes up um, with a little funky little thing called decompression melting, uh, which is a hard thing to think about in a place where we don't often see things melt just by taking pressure off of them. And ice actually doesn't follow that rule, so that makes it even more confusing. I digress. Um, but the mantle kind of comes up and melts in and forms rock to, to fill that space. And so these, these dark red parts on this map are those places where you've got fresh new crust being built. Um, and it's just coming right up from the mantle and melting as it comes up and cooling as it comes into contact with the very chilly ocean water. And so just as we're subducting continents on parts of the earth, we are building fresh brand new crust uh, at these mid-ocean ridges that are expanding to form oceans. That's exactly what's happening in the Atlantic right now. And the growth of the Atlantic is what broke up Pangaea. And has been you know spreading those continents further apart over the last oh goodness uh, oh my gosh how am I oh I've got it right here in front of me over the last 180 million years 
<laughs> there you go, Graham. I choked on the date. Oh, goodness. That's okay, Graham. It's not like we're geochronologists or anything. <laughs> so with that, let's let's jump in because I think it's a really cool thing to like to look at what these supercontinents look like. And so as we iterated in the beginning of this, this rock and pop up, um, based on a lot of work from geologists, mapping and characterizing rocks, we know what parts of these little subcontinents were stuck together even back 2 billion years. So as I mentioned, Kennerland is the first supercontinent we really know was covering a lot of the earth but it looks a lot different than the continental land masses now and that's because most of the land mass that we have on earth today wasn't actually there we're talking mostly cratons mostly the little bits of the continent that are the oldest parts right graham yeah that's right and so when we talk about the history of california uh, we, you know, we always note that the Californian crust is pretty young as far as crust goes. And that's because every time you have those ocean subduction centers, those volcanoes are pumping out a bunch of brand new rock. And those actually build new mini continents, or we actually just call them micro continents. That's a, you know, a typical term among geologists. And so over the entire, entirety of Earth's history, we started out with a few of these really big continental cores, um, which we call cratons. And then over all of geologic history, we've just been continually building more continents. And then they just sort of bump into and get caught up on the sides of other continents. And they decide that they like hanging out with their continent friends. And so they stay there. And so continents have actually kind of been, you know, continually growing over the course of, of Earth's history. But yeah, Kennerland is kind of the first one we know. But it's kind of this rather measly, goofy looking little chili pepper sort of thing. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't much look like the Pangea that would come over 2 billion years later. That's right, Graham. And so basically what we have is cycles of supercontinents. And you could see they're pretty, they're pretty well sort of spaced out in the early Earth's history. And you have these openings and these closings. And as you do that, you're building those microcontinents, as you said. And so we can move forward in geologic time a little bit. And now we're sort of, sort of looking at um, supercontinents that we can really put in the context of modern day continents. We can say, say where modern day continents were in those supercontinents. And so starting in Pinocchio over here, and that's 630 million years ago, you have a supercontinent, but you also, but we can see that we're able to put our modern day land masses in there. Um, and we should plug that when you make a supercontinent, it changes the surface of the earth and the way earth processes happen. And so it just so happens that during this Pinocchio supercontinent, that's when we had our snowball earth or the whole earth covered in ice. And so the reason that the whole earth was able to be covered in ice back then had a lot to do with the supercontinent. So without going into too much detail, we should make the point that supercontinents change the way Earth systems work. Right, Graham? Yeah, I think that's, you know, that's such an important observation that like, you know, we, we think about climate change that's going on today. Climate is very much controlled by how oceans interact with one another, how the winds and atmosphere interact with the oceans and the land masses. And so, you know, for a climate system that is so sensitive to something like just the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, imagine what happens if you completely rearrange how winds and currents move across the planet. It makes a big difference. That's right, Graham. So moving forward in time a little bit, we, know we had Pinocchio, we broke it up. Then we have a very long lived supercontinent and that's Gondwana. And so you can see here that modern day Africa, South America and Antarctica were a part of that and then here's modern day India. And so Gondwana start, is formed 550 million years ago and it doesn't actually entirely break up until you break up Pangaea. And at first that was sort of counterintuitive to me, but it, it actually is what form, is one of the two parts of what Pangaea is, right Graham? That's right. And, and I love how in this, you know, this picture of Gondwana, 
you can see just sort of around the periphery of this globe map, ooh, looks like there's a little bit of a, a continent over on the horizon there. And that thing is on a crash course with Gondwana. That's right. So this is, this is a continuum of supercontinents for the past 550 million years up till 170. And that is you form Gondwana, you have some other land masses, and then you crash those other land masses into the top of Gondwana and you make Pangaea. So uh, folks at home might notice South America, Africa, Antarctica. Here's those same, those same continents, South America, Africa, and Antarctica. So all the rest of that stuff what we call Laurentia is what makes the two lobes of Pangaea. So cool. Oh, Gavin, what I wouldn't give to take a vacation to Pangaea sometime. I think oh my goodness. I would take a road trip because you oh. would never have to get on a boat. I know. I know. I hope there are gas stations back then though. <laughs> so Graham, enough kidding aside, <laughs> there's still one burning question. And that is once you make a supercontinent, how do you break it up? Any ideas? Ooh, Gavin. Well, I would like, I would, I would imagine you would need some way to drive, right? If we, if we move continents apart by making oceans, we would need something to start melting out in an ocean in the middle of a continent. But Gavin, is there anything on this fantastic earth that's capable of doing that? There must be because we have oceans, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, these things called plumes. These are a contentious topic in geology, um, but when you have plumes that are these, these very large heat sources coming from the base of the mantle, they cause a bunch of melting up in the crust. So here we have a, a schematic of a plume. Think about it as a large heat, heat source coming from below. It's coming up through the asthenosphere and it is causing melting in the lithosphere. So this can happen even over a supercontinent. And what happens when you have a bunch of melting at the base of the lithosphere under a supercontinent for a long period of time, Graham? Gavin, you're gonna melt and melt and melt and eventually that mantle is gonna push its way up to the surface. And once you've got that, that mantle up at those shallow locations, you're making an ocean at that point. And you're gonna start spreading and splitting those continents apart. We call it a rift. A rift is any time where we start pulling apart the crust. And yeah, it's, it's kind of wild. Like you said, these mantle plumes, there are these sort of these upwelling columns of rock and they sort of splay out and spread out when they hit the, the base of the lithosphere. You know, a way you can sort of imagine this or do this as a home experiment is to get a, a little pitcher of hot water, maybe boil your kettle and put a little piece of ice out. And if you just kind of drip or put a steady trickle onto that ice, you'll sort of melt a little hole down into it. Well, a plume is just doing that, but upside down where you've got hot rock coming up and just sort of, you know, sort of like almost in some cases melting in other cases, just kind of pushing rock out of the way and forcing its way up to the surface. And yeah, you haven't, you've got this picture of a, of a rift that, a, a rift that could have been, but never quite worked out. Can you tell us about that one? That's right, Graham. So the United States is actually a very interesting place to study rifts because we have two things that we call failed rifts. And so sometimes this, uh, this process goes all the way and creates an ocean. It pulls continents apart and creates an ocean like we would think of as the Atlantic. And you alluded to the idea that rifting like this is what pulled Pangaea apart and made the Atlantic Ocean. Remember, we we showed the slide that was the spreading centers. This is the birth of a spreading center right here. A rift is the birth, birth of a spreading center, but it doesn't always happen that way. And so in the middle of our country, up in some of these swing states up here, like Wisconsin, um, you had a failed rift. And that was, you had this upwelling of hot rock, you start to rift, but the, the rift never materialized, but it has, caused some very, very large features to look the way they do on the surface of the earth today. And Graham, you made this point and I really liked it. What was that feature you were talking about? Yeah, so Lake Superior, this great big basin with kind of this hinge point in it. Um, and you know, Lake Superior is, a, is, a, is 
a special one of the Great Lakes. My heart will always be given to Lake Michigan. I grew up in Wisconsin, real close to Lake Michigan. So that'll always be my favorite Great Lake. But Lake Superior, that basin is from where a failed rift, the sort of central arc of a failed rift, they often tend to sort of have these arced shapes. Um, it was, was originally placed. And so because that was the center of that rift, it's actually really undermined a lot of the crust there. It sits a little bit lower. And so it gets, sets you up to have this great big basin that's filled in by a lake today. Ah, Graham, what could have been? There could have been an ocean there, but instead you just have lakefront property. I guess that's good enough for you in Wisconsin. <laughs> that's so, right, it's a pretty big lake. <laughs> fair enough. So I think that we've done it though. This is, we started off with how you move the plates. We built up some continents. We looked at supercontinents over time. And then we showed, we showed how supercontinents die. And that is rifts. That's great. Oh, what a great narrative arc, Gavin. You know, <laughs> what, a, what a great way to think about the history of this planet. How exciting. I know, it is exciting. I, I uh, can bring it a little full circle. Um, if you like to getting back to um, what we alluded to at the beginning with uh, the political climate of today. Um, because the other topic that has come up with continents that I just wanted to run past you all is like the political aspect of continents. Mm, okay. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so can you speak to that a little bit of like where, um, what is a geologic continent versus like where does politics come into that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Gavin, do you think we could hop back to that? that, that oh. Map of the, uh, oh yeah, no worries. Um, just, yeah, just so we can see kind of where those boundaries lie because yeah. as, as geologists, when we think of continents, we think of one sort of continuous piece of interconnected lithospheric plate, not just lithospheric plate, but lithospheric plate with continental crust, right? Those things that sit up above the ocean, um, which is, I think, a little bit different from how from how people tend to describe their continents in terms of like human geographies. That's right, Graham. And it always makes me laugh when I see maps like this, where we're looking at a supercontinent, but we have it all divided by by the current <laughs> uh, political political countries. But again, as geologists, it's useful to to locate yourself on a map, but also geology doesn't know anything about politics. So it's really sort of, there's a, an interconnectedness when we look at maps, but as geologists, we don't really think about it that way. Definitely. And certainly in terms of continents, you know, we're often taught in our geography classes of Europe and Asia as two different, you know, continents and only to people are they that way. I think the, the earth doesn't really see them as, as two different places. <laughs> That's a really good point, Graham. Um, I have like so many questions actually <laughs> um, from this month's pop-up. So I'm going to ask a couple of them, but I won't take up too much time. So I'm curious about the Nougaty Athenosphere mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, so you were talking about how the Athenosphere is um, under a lot of pressure. And so that's why it's causing this ductile kind of movement. And it got me wondering about whether or not you would consider the Athenosphere, so if it's a rock, at that stage, would it be more of like a metamorphic rock or would it be more of an igneous rock? It's a good question. Great question. I would say that that's metamorphism in action. Um, it's because as long as it's in the solid state, it is, you know, it, it, it's not molten. So it's not, it's, well, it's hard to say. There may have been a time when that was molten. Um, very early in Earth's history, it might have been, we might have had a soupy planet um, with a, a magma ocean. And so, yeah, I would make the argument that it's probably a metavolcanic at this point. It's a metamorphic rock um, that started out maybe as a volcanic rock or, or as like a magmatic rock. But I don't know, Gavin, what do you think? I concur, Graham. I think that it's a metavolcanic. I think that it is actively metamorphosed. And if you drill down and you picked it up and you looked at it, it would look like a really crunched up peridotite or something like that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, metavolcanic. So okay. metavolcanic. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll throw one other question at you. And this, I'm curious about 
like where these um, rifts and subduction zones and things like that happen. Um, one of the images that you shared that's more of like a contemporary image showed the trench like through um, the Atlantic. And, and then there were some other um, areas too and they're all like very uh, like longitudinal. Mm -hmm. And so I was curious about these convection zones and our spherical earth. And it just seems to me like when I think about tectonic movement, I think I envision it as being very much sort of like east-west, like mm -hmm. around like the following along the equator. But is that like, is it actually more spherical? Does that happen at different stages in different directions? And at, even like at one time, could it be, you know, pulling at different degrees in different, different spots? Yeah, I think you've, you've touched on a really interesting point. And as you can, you can see my cursor, right? Yeah. Um, as you said, it looks very longitudinal. We were showing that the contemporary map, I could also, I could pull that up really quickly, but I wanted to talk about that in terms of this plate map. So let me just pull up that uh, contemporary map that you were talking about. So this is the, um, the mid-ocean ridges. This is what it looks like if you don't think about the tectonic plates. And it does look very longitudinal, right? But if you think about it in terms of the tectonic plates, it really is running along the sides of a few tectonic plates. And each of those tectonic plates are moving in their own sort of way. And as you said, a lot of times it's east-west. So all the subduction zones that we think of, like the old subduction zone along California, which is now transformed, but it used to be an east-west subduction zone. The subduction zone down in South America, the one down through J Japan, those are moving east-west. But you also have subduction zones that are moving north-south, if you think about the one across the Aleutian Islands. And so it really depends on where you are in the plate. And as you alluded to, it does. it is a function of where the convection cells are going, but in terms of the subduction zones themselves, uh, it is it depends on where you are in the plate. Would you agree, agree Graham? Yeah, yeah, totally. And I think we're kind of in a, you know, I, I don't know so much about how this has looked in the past, but we do have these sort of two roughly north-south oriented spreading centers. But there's also that one that's sort of ringing the bottom of the planet too. And that's, you know, where the Antarctic plate um, is, you know, should be growing apart from, from the, all the northern um, lithospheric plates. And so that, that's definitely like a, an east-west running um, spreading zone. Great. Cool. Okay, thanks. I have so many other questions, but I'll leave it at that. Um, so uh, I also just wanted to make sure that everyone watching um, knew about the other thing that y'all are doing um, for the museum now. Uh, do you want to just mention what you started up last month for us? Sure, yeah. So we last month had our first blog post. It was about caves. Um, and so these are coming out on uh, every uh, third week of the month. This next one will be about, uh, about sand. And we'll talk about our perspective on what it looks like to look through uh, go to the beach and look at the sand and what that means for the history of the area, how the beach is formed, but also why you have those little parts of rocks, of those specific rocks there. So it's sort of a, these blogs are like a way of, for us to share our perspective on different curiosities and musings of the geologic world. Yeah, couldn't have said it better myself. Thanks, Gavin. Yeah, well, we're really excited to be able to feature it. Um, it's called Rock Record. And uh, yeah, I think one of the things that um, we appreciate so much about Gavin and Graham is that it's, uh, we have this opportunity to really understand the science of our earth um, with you guys, but also um, your perspective on like the meaning of it all for us today. Um, these big, long geologic time scales that we think about, but also like rooted in our human experience today. And that's what I really love about your new blog series. So. Um, Hope you all uh, have a chance to read um, those. And we will see you again next month on the first Wednesday of the month in December. Enjoy your November. <laughs>